please stand. Welcome everyone to these solemn ceremonies as we gather to celebrate and remember the life of Debbie Sue Crombie Sellers. I want to express appreciation for you all traveling from the far realms of Ohio and Alexandria, from Salem, the water painting ladies, and the Venton aerobic ladies and especially the Venton neighbors. We appreciate all that you've meant to Debbie and later we'll ask for some appreciation that you may have for what she has meant to you. But now I wanna turn it back over to Steve Manuel for our service. I'd like for us to begin this morning with a word of prayer and some scripture. Heavenly Father, we uh, rejoice in the fact that we can gather in your name in the most difficult times, and we can seek your face, and we can call out to you, Lord, in those moments when we grieve, and in those, those moments that we celebrate. You're the same God who loves us and who desires your very best for our lives. And Father, this morning, we ask that your spirit will have the freedom to work in each heart that's here. Speak to us, Lord, as we have our own memories of Debbie and the times that we've shared with her. Uh, speak to us, Lord, remind us of those things that uh, bring joy and happiness. And as we leave this place today, may we carry those good thoughts and celebrate the fact that we were privileged to know Debbie. Father, honor yourself through the reading of these scriptures, these passages. Speak to our hearts because we look to you for that comfort. And it's in Jesus' name that we ask this. Amen. John 14 says this. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, and if it were not so... I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, and I'll receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And then Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my father as well. From now on, you do know him and you have seen him. Debbie's brother, Roger, is going to come and share the obituary with us this morning. I don't do a lot of public speaking. <laughs> uh, first, to start with the, Debbie's obituary. She was born in Euclid, Ohio. She was the daughter of the late Roger and Julia Fisk Crombie. Debbie married her one true love, Art, in 1974. Together, they made their home in Rockville, Maryland, Heidelberg, Germany, Sterling, Virginia, before retiring to Vinton. 
She enjoyed arts, crafts, and water aerobics. She loved to spoil her cats and dog. In addition to her husband, she survived by two brothers, myself, uh, Robert over there, and uh, grandchildren, I'm sorry, two stepdaughters, Carol K. Short, her husband Philip, uh, of Frederick, Maryland, Cheryl Sellers Johnston of Urbana, Maryland, six grandchildren, Brad, Amanda, Ashley, Brooke, Spencer, Paige, five great-grandchildren, nephews, nieces, Fred, Gwen, Roger, Nicole, Robert Jr., Sarah, Gabriel, and John, and numerous other family members and friends. That doesn't say a lot, the true Debbie. Uh, I, I wasn't scheduled to do this, but I'm going to talk a little bit about Debbie. Okay. She was my little sister. I used to torment her. Uh, she then, when she grew up, spent the rest of her life telling me what I should be doing. So <laughs> uh, I'm going to miss her terribly. Uh, expect to see her one day. I want to uh, congratulate Rob, not Rob, I'm sorry, Art, uh, my brother-in-law, for the love he gave her and the exceptional care he's given her over the last few years. And uh, as they would say in the old neighborhood back up in Cleveland, he's a stand-up guy. So that's all. Thank you. And Debbie's life touched all of us here, and uh, I'm going to invite some of you, if you would like, to come up and just share a few words. Of, it, it can be some, uh, some happy thoughts, some funny things that went on, and, uh, but you come and fe feel free to do that. Please stand in front of the mic so that we can hear you and the recording. You want to be able to pick that up. And Art's going to begin with a few words of his own. I knew that this was going to be part of the program, but I didn't realize that as I look back over our lives together, that the most touching memory that I might share with you now happened just the day after she passed away. It just tore my heart out and brought tears to my eyes. But because of her illness, I've been sharing the responsibilities at home, some of the work and some of the pleasures, all of the pleasures. Some of the work, uh, cleaning. I really enjoy the cleaning. Uh, I could do an infomercial on the new spin mop that I got that just helps me do all of that, all of that so well. I don't mind the, uh, the other chores around the house like, uh, like the laundry, things in, things out, the right settings. and things out but I really did not like over the years I was looking back over the years and now I'm remembering on the day after she passed away that I did not like to fold the clothes but there was no no sharing of responsibility anymore at that time so I did it and at first I felt the same begrudgingly I have to go through you know, the underpants. There were so many underpants, it seemed like she needed a new pair every day. <laughs> so, as I did it, there was the pile. But then I realized there were only a couple left and this was the last time. And then I began to think of what those represent. Each one represented a day in our lives that was precious. I put them in the I put them in the dresser, I closed the door, and I locked them away with my fond memories of Debbie, and they'll, they'll stay forever. God bless you, peace be with you, Debbie dear, my one true love. Thank you. If you'd like to share a word, feel free to come on forward here.
I don't know if I can speak after that, but um, I'm Cheryl. I'm Dad and Debbie's daughter. Uh, I just want to say when Debbie came into Dad's life, um, Carol and I were little, uh, very little, but I do remember the light that she brought into Dad's life. And even at that age, we saw how happy he was and how his life was turning around. And she did that for him every day of their lives together. And I'm so grateful for her for that. Um, so thank you. Hi, my name is Robert Crombie, and Debbie was my sister. Um, I'm going to start with, uh, you know, she was a very significant part of my life at an early age. Like my brother, she's older than me. So she's 10 years older than me. So a lot of times she was the one that was. Uh, responsible for my care and I don't think it's because she had to be I think it's because she wanted to be she wanted to be part of my life and my growing up I can remember uh, a lot of times well good memory that comes to my mind is when uh, on the holidays my mom would be in the kitchen and she'd be making pies the old school way and rolling out the pie dough and then trimming the pie after it got in the shell and then my sister and I'd be waiting for the leftover pie dough and we would get it and roll it out and put butter on it and some cinnamon and some sugar and roll them up and put them in the oven and uh, and we called those do flickies and uh, that was a very uh, fond memory. Um, my sister, or if something happened in my life, I can remember getting beat up on the way home from school one day. Now, she wasn't having any of that. She grabbed me and dragged me back to where it happened, and, I, and, the, and the other boy's brother was there, and, and uh, well, we had it out again, and there was no losing that fight because I'd, I would have been in trouble when I got home. So, but I thought she was going to beat up his brother, and and uh, that's just the way my, you know she was. You know, she was always looking out for me, and uh, I think my you know uh, I can remember sitting. It was the oh, well, it had to be like seventy two, seventy one, whatever it happened. I can remember uh, she and I sitting around the uh, kitchen table at our house listening to this little cheesy AM FM radio and it was the day the Beatles broke up and we were both traumatized and John and Ringo and Paul had all buried or I mean John and Ringo and George had all buried Paul somewhere and I'm not quite sure where it was but it was very obvious that uh, they were broken up and uh, and she and I were both broken up about it. Uh, she was a very strong influence on my, uh, my taste in music at an early age. Um, you know, I had so many things I was like thinking of when, when we were growing up, but you know, you know, I can remember also when she got married to uh, Art, who, you know, I could say brother-in-law, but he's my brother and uh, he, uh, you could tell right off the get-go that the two of them were meant to, to be together. They cared very much for each other. And they shared that with me, both of them. Uh, I would go there, I would go there on the, uh, for, in the summertime for a week here or there, and, and uh, they both went out of their way to make sure I was entertained and, and had things to do and, and again, I can remember, well, it was a different time there. I think I was like 14. I was smoking at that age, and I was allowed to back at home. Um, but I remember some, uh, some mother saw that I was smoking and, and uh, had to bring it up. It took my cigarettes away. Oh, she, Debbie was mad about that, too. But, uh, 
and uh, she had words with her, but uh, I can remember Art and Debbie both taking me to the first time I ever saw Washington, D.C. Um, we went in, I don't know, was that through Rockville, possibly, overlooking the city? And I had never seen anything so beautiful in my life as to look down upon the city and all those marble statues. And, and it was an experience that I owe to my sister and Art. And because there came a time when it wasn't just my sister, it was the two of them, and they were one, and they, they went out of their way for me. And uh, I could go on and on. There's a lot of stories I have to tell. Maybe you tell them later, but I'm going to miss my sister. And uh, I know she's, uh, she's being looked well after now. Thank you. I'm Roger, I'm Debbie's nephew, um, and Art's nephew. Um, and I think Rob and I had a lot of similar experiences, though, years apart. My, you know, really fondest memories of Art and Debbie are coming to visit and um, them showing it's just a wonderful time in D.C. We went whitewater rafting, we went to the beach, we camped, we went to New York City, and Art was almost hit by a car on Fifth Avenue. Um, I really remember that. It was, I think we were reenacting um, singing in the rain and you got a little too close to the curb um, <laughs> but she always looked af out after me as a you know as an aunt should and spoiled us and uh, you know I can remember coming up from college with friends and we would when we say crash this with the literal meaning of crash we would drive up eight hours um, Art and Debbie would host us and we would you know drop our stuff get on the metro head down to DC have fun come back at ungodly hours they would feed us well we would rinse and then we'd repeat again the same night uh, but they were so gracious and looked out for us and you could tell always had our best interests and uh, and so those are things I'll I'll remember about Debbie Anyone else have a word? <clears throat> if not, uh, Art has prepared something very special this morning, and he's going to come up and do that now. And I hope you'll share the story behind that of, uh, of why you're choosing that particular hymn. Come on. <clears throat> About 16 years ago, my mother wrote a note to her family. She said, Dear family, I would like to have this hymn played or sung at my funeral. Thank you, love mom, November 2004. In 2008, that came true. We did. This was part of the program that day in Rockville, Maryland when all the congregation that was there sang this song. Well, contrary to what Roger says, I do not sing and dance, <laughs> but I am gonna recite, if you will. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. T'was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've none no less days to sing God's praise 
than when we first began. It was not 16 years ago, but about 16 days ago that Debbie asked for that in particular. She added her name to the bottom of this note and said she wanted, well, she wanted the bagpipes to be played. And you can't sing and dance very well to the, to the bagpipes, so she knew that I would maybe do this part better here to recite than to be trying to sing and dance it. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. For me, this is a tremendous honor to be asked to share and to help in the celebration of the life of Debbie Sellers. And Art, um, I'm humbled and I thank you for this privilege to be able to uh, share a little bit from God's word, uh, words of comfort. As I considered the words that I would share today, I, you know, thinking about Debbie's life, something kept coming to my mind and that was the word breath. And that's for several reasons. First, I thought of those years that I've known Art and Debbie, and I remember the struggle that she's been through, and it's been going on for four or five years. And it's slowly gotten worse and worse until, uh, you know, the end. So, you know, I thought breath. There's a lot of good things in the scripture about breath. It, it has some impact. You know, it was a great challenge for her to constantly be on oxygen and and that illness dramatically changed her life as well as Art's life. The second reason that breath came to mind is that the words used in the Bible for, for breath can also, are also used to talk about uh, God's Holy Spirit. Um, some places it might refer to that as breath, as wind or air, spirit. And God breathed into what he formed from the dust of the earth and man became a living being. He became a soul. But you know, beyond the physical creation, God pours out his mercy on us through Christ as his spirit again dwells in us. And we find eternal life through Christ. We find all that we need in living and, and growing and developing by the power of his spirit. And the spirit of the living God is as important as breath itself. 
and we discover that full meaning of life when we experience the abiding presence of our Lord. And it's God's Spirit whom we call upon today to comfort us, to walk with us through a valley. And not only in those struggles and illnesses that we face as individuals, but especially in now in times of great grief. It's his spirit who will comfort our hearts today. The Lord will bring us peace. And in the days ahead, it'll be the Lord's spirit who'll grant peace and help us to adjust and find comfort. A little further down in this Gospel of John, the same chapter, Jesus went on to say this. He said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. The writer of Ecclesiastes long ago wrote these words. There's a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. And a time to embrace and a time to refrain. A time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. Those verses in Ecclesiastes 3, they're beautiful, they're full of meaning. But the writer, thousands of years ago, he did not have our richer perspective in Christ that we find in the book of Romans in the New Testament. Because there Paul wrote these words, Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all of these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. We do mourn. That's part of our experience when we face the death of a loved one. But we needn't mourn like those without hope. A Bible story that moves me when I consider the personal touch of Jesus in the midst of our suffering is found in John 5. It says this, that sometime later Jesus went up to Jerusalem for a feast of the Jews. And now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. And here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind and the lame, the paralyzed, and one who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he'd been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. And then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and he walked. You know, a man came to that pool hoping to have the strength and the good fortune to make it into the water at just the right moment to be healed of all of his suffering. Now, we don't know that he sat there for all 38 years, you know, every day going down. We don't know that. It may have just been a month. It could have been two months. It could have been a year. It could have been as long as four or five years. But we do know this. His affliction was so severe 
that without help he could not make it to the water. For 38 years he did suffer. And throughout those long years he longed for the one day, for that day in the future when he would be set free, when he would be whole. Debbie suffered for years. As her health failed, she could no longer enjoy working out in the yard. She couldn't do her crafts. She couldn't go out with her friends that she loved to do. She couldn't exercise in the pool with her friends when they did their aerobics. She struggled just to walk across the room in those last days and weeks. Her weakened lungs, they slowly began to limit her activities. She longed to do what she had once done. And, and what a frustration if you've been there in your own life and to uh, suffer some kind of uh, disabling injury. And, and your mind says, I can do that, I want to do that, and, and you can't. And she could no longer do those things that at one time were just, just so easy, like breathing. But life was changing. Some might simply give up in defeat. They might throw up their hands and say, I don't want any more of this. But Debbie did not surrender. She fought on, adjusting to each new challenge that came along as needed. And with the love of her life, with art by her side, she faithfully and constantly faced the struggle. Like the man Jesus met at this pool in Jerusalem, Debbie found freedom from suffering and she found new breath. She's no longer tethered to oxygen masks and heavy tanks and what had been imprisoned through illness and suffering has been set free. And hers is a celebration that all of heaven is participating in right now. She has entered into her rest and she's discovering what it is to have a completely whole and unfettered body. This is a time to celebrate her life and her memory. And Debbie did live a full life. She experienced many adventures along the way. She had a gift to not only make friends, but to nourish those friendships through the years. And she knew what it was to be generous and compassionate. And in spite of her own physical battle, she continued to be concerned about others, about friends or family who were struggling with their own needs. Debbie was a joy to be with, and if you knew Debbie well, you knew her wit, you knew her sense of humor, and I imagine this morning some of your minds have gone back and can still hear her laugh and see her smile, and most, if not all, in this room today tasted some of her delicious creations. She loved to prepare food for her friends and entertain them with her hospitality. We're blessed to have known Debbie and to have built wonderful memories with her memories that will live on. John wrote again in chapter 1 of his book, Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. You know, that's the good news that Jesus brings us, that no matter our condition here on earth, we have God's promise of hope and peace through Jesus Christ. As Art read a few minutes ago, God's amazing grace is indeed a sweet sound. He gives sight where we are blind. He relieves our many fears and carries us through the storms of danger and toil to bring us safely home. And you know, even after 10,000 years, we will have just begun to live in the presence of our merciful Lord. to be wise 
my shepherd I shall not want he maketh me lie down in green pastures he leadeth me beside the still waters he restoreth my soul he leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake and yea though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death I will fear no evil for thou art with me thy rod and thy staff they comfort me Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, and my cup it runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Would you stand for a word of prayer and remain standing? Father God, you are our shepherd. And we like sheep, sometimes we run around and don't know what we're doing or where we're going. Sometimes we suffer one ill or another. 
But you come along and scoop us up and you love us. In spite of any shortcoming, in spite of any frailty, in spite of our complaints, you love us because you are that good shepherd. Father, you have brought kind memories this morning. You are touching our hearts. You are granting comfort and peace. Thank you. Thank you for that. And Lord, we look to you for the future days because we know that there will be other days and times when we might get down, we might struggle, we might be in another valley. May we never forget that you are the God of the valleys as much as the mountaintops and that you love us no matter where we find ourselves. And we desire that surely goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our lives. And we ask that in the strength and the power of Jesus. Amen.